Hi, thank you, Mila. Hi, everybody. I'm Alison. I work as a project manager for Eva Glockenwalde. I can give everybody a minute to grab a water and knock mine over. Of course. Okay. We're good. Um, if anyone's listening to live translation, I know there's some hiccups earlier today. We're sorry about that. It's the internet. We are in Luckenwalde. We're doing our best. And so our panel is called Exhausted. Um, and we didn't call it that to necessarily speak on personal fatigue, although that is welcome here if anybody wants to share how you're feeling. But it's more to consider exhaustion broadly. What is human sustainability? What does it mean to have our own resources and those of the planet depleted? And is there a way to recharge? And at this point, do we even want to recharge? And how can we take care of ourselves and each other in this moment in time? both as individuals with varying needs, as cultural workers, as colleagues and as friends. And so to not only throw questions into this dome and let them evaporate, I want to take a moment to introduce my fellow tree stump dwellers, and then we'll give them a chance to speak. So next to me is Chem A, who is an artist with a background in anthropology. He's known for running the art meme page at freeze underscore magazine. If you don't follow already, please do. And for his site-specific installations, his work explores topics such as survival and alienation in the art world, often through a hyper-reflexive lens and collaborative projects. Next to Chem, we have Victoria Sloita, who has worked as an independent curator and producer for more than 10 years in the fields of contemporary art, architecture, film, and has been appointed director of Rupert Center for Art, Residencies and Education since March 2023. Special shout out to Rupert for being a wonderful partner in the Sustainable Institution Project that we have with Creative Europe, as well as Luma R. Thank you very much. And next we have Klaas Kautenbrauer, who is a researcher, curator at the New York Institute in Rotterdam. After studying history and developing an art practice, he worked at the intersections of culture, tech, ecology since the late 90s, and has developed the ZOOP project on the design and implementation of an organizational model for collaboration between human and more than human life. Next to class, we have Rebecca Salvadori, who is a Natalo australian video artist based in London. Over the last 10 years, she's engaged with experimental music with a great interest in finding ways to connect the moving image with sound and live performance practices. Her film works act as constellations of highly personal and willfully elusive heterogeneous elements multifaceted portraits of moments, people, and environments that can be approached from different angles as they move in between personal and transpersonal scales. And make sure to check out Rebecca's contribution later in Stadtbad, not to miss. And last but certainly not least, we have Jakob Stenger, who is a consultant in the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action, who works closely with renewable energy transitions and climate action, Having worked with NGOs, he has written several constitutional appeals against the federal states of Germany in concerns over their private, over their climate protection laws, as well as developed strategies for biodiversity conservation and private liability for climate damage. So, the way this is going to go is each presenter is going to have 10 minutes to share on their work by themselves which is also us trying to be considerate of everyone's attention span and energy levels. And then we'll have a bit of time to talk amongst ourselves on the stage, but then actually we're going to move the main discussion and give you, the audience, a chance to speak with these wonderful panelists at Stammtisch, which is by the fire truck under the silver tent. You can't miss it. And yeah, that's about it. So I'm going to pass over to Chem to take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jem. Uh, uh, you just mentioned yeah, I do Freeze Magazine, and uh, I also do exhibitions and installations, which I will talk about today. Um, I will start by... So meme thinking is like a, a word that, or like a term that I kind of made up to kind of refer to certain theories that I think to, could be thought about around memes. And uh, my journey started, as I just mentioned, with making memes. These are some early examples. And I was 
mainly interested or like so interested in like talking about the hypocrisies in the art world and these things lend themselves really well into making memes because there's like a nuance it's not such a direct uh, issue that there's like not, not like a good or bad person that you just show in a contrast but there's like complexities contradictions and uh, these make good memes and is a, so, uh, this is a recent one and uh, what I find interesting about memes is that I believe in the art world or like in the contemporary art world, there is like an adverse relationship between popularity and criticality that some, once something becomes popular, they kind of somehow lose their criticality or like this is undermined in the eyes of many people. So I like to think of memes as at the intersection of all of these things that hopefully it could be like an overlap that we could create here. And to illustrate this, the example that I like to use a lot is this hotel chain in the US. It's a hotel chain that has a sizable art collection and they also do quite interesting exhibitions. What I find interesting about this as a, another fellow art person is the judgment that I also project onto this just by the fact that this happens in a hotel. There might be many issues with it, but I think I find it interesting that at least in my experience, like, the, the, like as soon as you realize that this happens in a hotel, it, you immediately discredit any effect that this exhibition or this program might have. And I, I disagree with this. What I find more ironic about this is actually questioning whether art has ever been forward thinking in, in the past or ever had any impact on politics. I think there's an issue with how art is historicized or used to historicize the past and how we perceive it today and how there is this, I think, discrepancy between actually, I think art is more a representation of politics rather than has, like, I don't, I think it's, we need to question whether art had a, sizable political impact in the past, or at least this was the exception. Um, there are, of course, different art movements, such as Institute Critique, or us sitting on this panel, uh, that really uh, addresses this. Uh, but of course, within this, there are other issues about power structures and the difficulty of achieving this. So I actually don't find it very reasonable that actually this is the way to solve these problems. I think critique has a role, but critique isn't the thing that would actually solve this thing. It's like an external part of this or like a representation of it once again, but I think the responsibility falls on something else, even though I don't wanna push this onto other people. And going back to the idea of meme thinking, uh, there are some theories or references that I'd really like to mention. One of them is this book called The Image, it's Guide to Pseudo Events in America. So the event basically refers to any event that has been pre-planned. This fits perfectly with the art world. We like when you think about the news cycle, everything is a pre-planned event, a press release, a press conference, a meeting, a symposium. And even though this shouldn't change, like this is not a way to like discredit these things, I think it should come with a certain awareness. Like the example that this book is using to illustrate this is there is a new hotel that opens in a small town and they want to attract, attract, attract more visitors and uh, they do a reception and invite the most important people in the town. And this, of course, increases their credibility and they do more business. I think this is basically the definition of the art world too in many aspects. So I just lost connection with the thing here. Uh, yeah, this is a theory by Stuart Hall called encoding and decoding. It's basic, it basically refers to like in mass media how information is encoded and how this is later decoded by, like after being transmitted, are two different processes. Like when a TV reporter goes to the field and does a, a story, how people perceive this on the other side of the TV is different. It's a different part of the process. And I more and more realize that this is actually never seen as a part of the art world, that like we are talking about pre-planned events, everything, like nothing is spontaneous, there are no accidents in the art world. And also even the results of these pre-planned events, we are very inflexible in discussing them or like having honest feedback or saying this was a mistake. And I think this is a, this is a big issue. And I think we kind of completely disregard the decoding of uh, what is happening. This is just a silly example of a meme I made that to me backfired in this way, uh, that I had a certain intention in making this. And then some people were very upset. They were like, what about, I, I live in Alaska, is that fine? Or what about, <laughs> What about Malta? What about indigenous people? And I was like, you're really taking this to like somewhere I didn't mean to. 
The final theory that I really appreciate is called Overton window. And uh, this is the idea that, so the, the public opinion on any given subject is on a scale. And if you want to introduce, or like if you want to shift the public opinion in a certain direction, you shouldn't introduce sensible ideas, you should in introduce unthinkable ideas. The most stereotypical example of this is someone like Trump, that he had such crazy ideas that his less crazy ideas were just went under the radar. No one had the energy or the emotions to respond to them. I think this is super important. And with memes, this is quite easy. You can just make a meme like this that kind of suggests that with humor and talk about it and hopefully use it for like a more constructive cause. Uh, but for me, the most fundamental aspect of this is this quote that is like, like a paraphrase of Stuart Hall in a, from a, a presentation I listened to. I promise it is by Stuart Hall, but I actually couldn't find it later on. Uh, it's about right-wing populism and left-wing populism. And he basically says that we should actually be collectively cynical about things in general, and this should be the culture. Like, this is not uh, like a bad spiral or burnout, but we should just, yeah, share this. And once you're in a populist spiral, left wing or right wing, whatever you think, it's just like you already lost the game, and it's um, populism is the wrong way to just understand this. That's why, even though I believe that contemporary art discredits popularity, at the same time, I think it has to be really both. It has to be criticism and populism in one uh, bag. And for me, uh, when it comes to making installations and like art, this is a driving factor, same as in making memes. So I would like to show you this exhibition, which is not so visible, uh, that I made in Istanbul last year about exhibition texts. Uh, so the whole idea was to, so it actually is based on this meme. So I basically asked friends, one of which is actually one of who is in the audience right now, um, whether they could write an exhibition text that is so generic that could apply to any exhibition. And this was exhibited in a room, like a reading room, uh, with real exhibition texts on the wall, just like unaltered, just black and white, with uh, QR codes that take you to memes about these, and these fictional texts that you could take with you and just leave in an exhibition space and they would just work because they were so loose, so vague, like any other exhibition text, that it would achieve that. And for me, this is like a representation of this collective cynicism that it is, I think, even though I believe that art, the art world has never been forward thinking or open to change, there are certain things that we have the agency to do, and I think this comes from collective cynicism. These are just some other images. Another exhibition I did was about exhibition posters this time. And the idea again here was to inject a bit of collective cynicism into the, the communication material of art institutions. So I was commissioned by Louisiana Museum in Denmark uh, to do some sort of intervention. So I took these texts from uh, memes and turned them into exhibition posters uh, that um, really uh, like inserted it into the physical space. I see that I'm short on time, but I will be very quick. Uh, could you move forward? Yeah, so I made these f posters from the voice of a museum uh, that the audience would see, but they would probably miss that it's actually an intervention. And they were basically speaking as the museum to the audience and saying that, if you, yeah, some artworks look the same, or waiting to make an exhibition about today in 30 years. Um, and the final example is this one. Uh, this is from Grimmett Museum in Kassel. And if you move to the final image, it's the same from uh, Basel Social Club. And again, I find it interesting that these, uh, the final element of what I do is these signages and different forms of meme templates in physical spaces uh, to kind of, again, invoke the same type of collective cynicism in the audience. So, hello. I'm Victoria, as Alison already introduced me, Director of Rupert, uh, Center for Art Residences Edu and Education. Uh, and I also want, um, kind of in return, thank all EWERC team, Alison, Helen, Florin, and everybody else for um, inviting us to this very nice and um, um, kind of intimate setting. Um, and also, I didn't come here alone. Uh, there are like other people from Rupert, Rugile, Carolina, and Darius. So I also invite them to kind of uh, add to what I have to say, or you can also ask them questions as well. 
so a brief introduction for those that don't know. Uh, Rupert um, is a center for art, residences and education based in Vilnius, Lithuania. And it has been established in 2012 as a roaming para-academic artist education program. And since 2014 has expanded additionally with a residency program and moved into a new building on very picturesque banks of Vilnius City River in Eris. Uh, so up to today, Rupert manifests its mission through three interrelated programs. The residency program, uh, which is meant for artistic practices, introspection and self-reflective moments. The alternative education program that runs its course for six months and is based on collective exchange and gradual taking up of responsibility among the participating artists in the learning process. And the public program that is sort of a public interface between wider audiences and uh, participating artists. Uh, all these programs are dedicated to creating platforms for conversation, research and learning. And through them, Rupert supports local and international artists and thinkers in realizing their projects and establishing their creative practice on international scale. Uh, so when I joined Rupert in October last year, first as residency curator, relocating to Lithuania after more than almost 15 years living abroad, uh, I have found, I would say, perhaps uh, for people from outside, not so visible, but actually a very special system of caring for artists in place. Uh, and when I say that, I say that very sincerely. That's, uh, um, I think all throughout these 10 years, um, like a special relation has been developed. So what attracts more than 700 artists, curators, transdisciplinary thinkers to apply every year to the open calls of our programs is not only the serene regional park surroundings and spacious bright studios, uh, but also a very different kind of proximity between the institution, its staff and the artists that get involved in our programs. Uh, that proximity is spatial, where we work day to day just next to the three artist residency studios or are also closely following the collective processes that take place for half a year in their alternative education program. And uh, I think we truly build long-lasting professional friendships with the artists we work with. Uh, that spatial proximity is also very important to build different kind of relation to the artists where we can allow the artistic processes to guide us and where we look for appropriate public engagements and support structures for them. Uh, and for me, that is definition maybe not entirely of artist-run organization because we're, we're not producing artists. Mm -hmm. Uh, who established <laughs> Rupert, uh, but kind of artist-guided institution. And we constantly find ourselves oscillating, uh, trying to find the best way how to offer uh, a kind of a structure in advance, but also accommodate the creative process that might not have very clear outcomes in its beginning. And another important point that I found in Rupert's legacy uh, when I joined is its uh, 2020 project Interdependence and Care, curated by former Rupert curators Yates Norton, Kotrina Markevichute and Adomas Narkevichus, that explored how interdependence and care intersect with cultural, social, political and artistic practices. And the program brought together local and international speakers from diverse backgrounds, including law, activism, academia and the arts, and actively engaging, unpacking all sorts of ableisms proliferating in the culture field and society at large. Uh, the project questioned how care, both as a form of labor and as an ethical principle, is systemic, systemically devalued and put forward the urgency to consider our mutual dependency. Uh, the contributors were David Ruben, Rahila Gupta, Eli Clear, Eliza Chandler, Emma Hedich, Jos Boyce, Samantha Lippet, Catherine Gibson, Michael Karikis and Salome Vogelin and many others. And for those who are interested, it's still possible to explore those contributions in the first issue of Rupert Journal. Uh, but despite this great curatorial research that is available in our archive, I think we're still yet to become a better organization in terms of accessibility. Uh, but I think it has been instrumental to understand and be open 
uh, what we, in fact, as an organization, are also not able to do and to clearly understand our limitations as well as uh, what we can offer as a support structure. So from today's perspective, I see those limitations are all important to understand also how we can contribute to the planetary climate care, what kind of working relation we foster with each other and with our participating artists. And coming new to an arts organization like that and going backwards through this legacy is not only to see what we learned and unlearned discursively, but also as a next step to think how these programmatic legacies translate into improvement, how the institution works on an operational level. And perhaps on operational level would be to twist these limitations around and think where could they instigate some kind of positive degrowth and direct organizational resources the right way. Uh, because any kind of burnout, I guess, be it human or environmental, actually means going overboard from the resources available, uh, just probably as a very simple definition. Um, so yeah, my biggest challenge and goal is, I guess, to go from the curatorial concept of care to operational care. And for this, I don't have any solutions or answers yet, but I've been thinking of and I've been looking also actively, there are like so many initiatives that are existing already. So if you talk about human burnout, uh, there is this wage campaign in the US who is like uh, advocating for better payment for artists and cultural workers. There is the Gallery Climate Coalition that is uh, providing very clear guidelines how to reduce organizations' carbon footprint. Uh, there is a feminist culture house, this organization in F Finland, who's also providing very kind of generous guidelines how to improve accessibility and inclusion in artist spaces. Um, so yeah, my kind of final takeaway and offer for the discussion is, you know, how we can kind of just... Um, consolidate these networks of solidarity. And maybe I was even thinking today, perhaps in the institutional, a sustainable institution project also, you know, there are like all these different areas, somehow how to find these intersections between labor rights in the arts, um, environmental approaches and um, access, I guess that's it. And on the operational model, I think it's a great, perfect segue to Klaas's presentation. Yes, thank you very much. Um, um, Klaas Kuitenbrouwer, researcher at the at New Institute in Rotterdam and um, their initiator of the ZOWOP project that I will tell you about. It has connections with, well, in several ways with the two previous, hopefully also the next uh, presentations. This is the way your default economic actor, sorry, I'm taking first a very short but very grand narrative and then I'll focus on the here and now. So this is the grand narrative. This is the cosmogram of how a default economic actor looks at the world, where econ economy is the fundamental understanding of how the world works, then ecology is this kind of subset of relations in the middle. That, well, and I don't have to explain what problems that has led to. Uh, so I'll skip that. Next slide, please. Um, um, this, this would be the first mental move in order to be able to get, to, to, to start talking about something where we can make a difference, begin to make a kind of relevant, caring difference. So then um, the fundamental idea of how the world works, how the cosmos works maybe, is that of ecology, and then economy is this subset of relations in the middle, a deeply problematic subset of relations that is eating away in a kind of pathological way eh, um, these other kinds of relations in which kind of a lot of care and mutual interdependence is acknowledged and actually operational. Third slide. And then this is where we should go, in a way. So this is not how where we are, but this is a kind of an image, a cosmogram of how the world should look, in which uh, that thing in the middle is what you could call human economy. Um, 
which is a functional part of the rest of ecology, where the di fundamental difference, the opposition between nature and culture, or between ecology and economy is overcome, where we actually talk of what you could call a regenerative economy or um, human inclusive ecosystem, which would be the exact same thing, uh, for which we came up with the word zoonomy, as in a, an economy that takes care of all zoe. Next slide. So, um, this can take a whole hour, I'm not going to take that. Um, to kind of distinguish between, mm, let's say, dominant ways of understanding the world, this, this is the degenerative one, this kind of links to the previous picture. This one, uh, the first picture, this one links to the middle picture, and this is where we should go, sorry. So degenerative is net negative, business as usual, competitive, organization as machine. Uh, nature versus culture. Sustainable is the dominant paradigm of the day. Machine is also, in a, fa in a certain way, quite problematic. It aims at net zero, ignores everything that's already in the atmosphere. Um, it's focused at postponing, uh, let's say, doing less harm, but not actually turning things around. The fundamental question with sustainability may be, like, what is it we're trying to sustain? What is it? Is it, are we trying to sustain the world or are we trying to sustain an economic system that is actually, uh, is called for to fundamentally change? So sustainability may not be the paradigm we're looking for. The good thing is, it has, at least it's no longer fully competitive, it works on collaboration. Um, um, in terms of law and regulations, let's say business as usual reluctantly abides the law, where uh, sustainable organizations willingly engage in eco-social um, governance uh, reporting and in corporate social responsibility. It sees the organization as family. It's okay to feel okay. And it's also okay to not feel okay. You're at least you're part of us and we'll take care of you. But it is our family and it's not yours. Uh, and it sees nature next to culture. So we're still in the kind of split world. So regenerative, to me, is a kind of, is a different kind of paradigm. This looks for the net positive. It looks at the long term, but actually at the forever. A regenerative would be a system in which that contributes to the sustainability, sorry, to the life-sustaining capacity of the world. So it not longer just diminishes the toxic behavior, but it fundamentally contributes to the life-sustaining capacity of the world. It aims to restore and regenerate, which would mean if you would tackle that, if, if this would become a, regen uh, a possibility, then we're no longer in the midterm or the short term, then we're basically in the forever. All kinds of other pro uh, pro uh, problems come back, but that one we've tackled. It works from the idea of full interdependency, so that means we really need each other to work this out together. So all those caring relations kind of are, um, maybe not always voluntarily, but in a way um, unavoidable and kind of deeply essential to how we should work. Um, organization becomes a living system and it sees culture as nature as culture. So the split between nature and culture is overcome. This is not nature, eh? this is a particular community of certain species that some of which have grown here for, uh, since forever, some have come, on, come in later. Eh? Humans take care of it, it takes care of us. This is not nature versus culture, this is uh, some s a kind of particular community of different kinds of species that care of each other. And this is the same everywhere. And all those communities are slightly different. There is no monolithic nature outside the world of humans. Next slide. The images I use are by Patricia de Ruiter, a photographer that, um, for three reasons, um, um, she's a photographer for many reasons, but the reason I use this picture is three. Um, <laughs> she never makes a separation between kind of the foreground and the background. Objects are never isolated from their surroundings. They're kind of full connection. So the, in a way, the image is taken from the middle. Uh, um, secondly, she tends to take perspectives which are not your default human height. So uh, other bodies, other perspectives are taken into our um, are possibilities um, in, in watching these pictures, are implied in these pictures. And thirdly, she does not make a distinction between the world of the non-humans and that of the humans. So this is, uh, this is a psychopath outside of Amsterdam. Next slide. So operation was invented, Zoop was invented to make that grand narrative kind of um, slightly more likely. I'm not sure if it will take, uh, save the world, but it opens a pathway to finding out how an organization might contribute to a regenerative logic. It's short for Zoe operation, cooperation with Zoe, with life. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. It's an organization model 
that takes care of a learning process or it is a learning process that needs an organization model for it to work. These are completely interdependent. And if many organizations adopt it, it's a fantastic basis for collaboration. Next slide, please. So this is the same grand narrative, but then on the scale of where we would be. Um, this is your default economic um, organization, uh, understands that there's an issue with ecology, but ecology is not us. It's somewhere else and also it's a big question mark. Next slide, please. So this would be the move at the moment you realize you're actually in the middle of it and actually everything is the middle of it, you're in the middle of it, that plant is the middle. Uh, everything that is here is also the middle of an ecology, of ecology. This is the moment you become ripe for, uh, actually you become a zoop. That's the moment where you introduce in your organization a human with one specific task. Um, it's actually, it's a role, it can be taken by many humans, it's an ex there's a whole support structure around it. And this job of this person is to speak on behalf of the Zoe. So to make sure that the interests of other than human life are taken into account in decision making of the organization. There's, this leads to many questions that we'll get into at the Stumptish, but we don't have time now. Next slide, please. Um, what happens is that ecology moves to the foreground. Next slide, please. Your decision-making processes transform, all kinds of other concerns come into the picture and things you took for granted uh, are no longer taken for granted. Things are looked at from many different perspectives and if things go well, your behavior changes and your operational sphere transforms with it. Next slide, please. This is where we are now. This is me and my colleagues. We're the organization that helps other organizations to become ZOOPs. This is a separate legal body that we set up uh, in order to ensure the independence of these people that take up this role of speaker for the living. So this is a, a foundation that has one task, and it is to assign a speaker for the living with the assignment to um, represent the interest, to talk on behalf of the interests of other than human life. This is the full assignment. So how you do it is up to the speaker and the organization. But this makes sure that these people are not in the hierarchy of the organization. You can imagine that... Let's say if you're hired to do this by something that has a hierarchy, uh, that at some point a kind of friction emerges, a kind of kind of unsolvable, but I think we should do this, yeah, but uh, sorry, you're just, uh, I know you want this, but uh, at, at the end of the day, the budget only allows us to do this, so we can't work with your advice right now. Uh, and then you're basically, this is the role of the sustainability organ um, officer usually. Um, and they're kind of, with a limited budget, responsible for transforming fundamentally an organization that never works, that never touched the core processes. It's a sad assignment. So this at least ensures the independence of the speaker. Sorry, this mechanism. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. A little bit about the learning process. Next slide, please. Um, what you do when you have a speaker for the living on board is you begin to first read and map the ecological relations, your, the social ecological relations you're participating in. And you try to understand them not just as facts, but as you also try to qualify them in terms of the distinction between degenerative and regenerative, where regenerative would be a kind of relation that sustains all bodies involved, a degenerative would be a relation that only sustains certain bodies and not others. So we found by doing this, by doing this at least for one year now at that new institute, and there are several more organizations on their way to become ZOOPs, is that these things come in, these kind of interventions, sorry, I forgot one thing, um, you distinguish, d distinguish between regenerative and degenerative, and then you apply yourself, you commit yourself to transforming bundles of these degenerative relations into regenerative ones, step by step, process by process, year by year. We're doing this for over one year now at the Nieuwe Institute, which has had led to some um, remarkably fast changes. Other problems turn out to be extremely complicated and require a lot of collaboration and research. We found, uh, this is my last kind of point, that the kind of interventions that you do as ZOOP come in three clusters, three flavors, Essential is sensitizing, sensitizing to the possibility of equal relations, sensitizing to the fact that you can actually listen to other, other than human bodies and that they make all kinds of choices that you can uh, respect and just observe uh, the choices they make and that you can collaborate. 
if this is kind of ongoing, if this is slightly uh, internalized, then you can start reorganizing. This is basically doing things differently, everything in your organizational scope, which leaves everything else. The strategizing, how to collaborate, how to protect yourself from logics which are harmful. Um, I don't have time to go into the example, sadly, but this is basically it. Um, last slide, please. This is where we are. Uh, one functional ZOOP today at Nieuwe Institute in Rotterdam. This year, at the end of this year, there will be three more, uh, actually four more, a farm, uh, housing, living, working co collaboration, a uh, heritage site, a um, big, big old fortress, and uh, this is a kind of network organization of 120 little organizations all over the country. Next year, we're going to set up seven ZOOPs in seven European coastal cities, part of a big European project, and also several first commercial uh, ZOOPs with commercial um, organizations um, that I also hope to talk to you about a little bit at the Stammtisch. I'll leave it that, at that. Thank you. Whoa. <laughs> uh, so thank you for the introduction and I'm very happy to be here uh, in this uh, special place and um, I've been reflecting a bit about what to say uh, in these 10 minutes and I thought that the best way to start was to talk about what's happening here in the program in relation to my work. And uh, so tonight there will be Sandro Musida, who is here, in, here as well, uh, performing Portraits of Friends uh, in the Stadtbad. There will be also Kobe Say playing live. And uh, tomorrow night there will be um, the screening of the film All We Got Is Us In The Moment, which is a sort of a portrait of a... Portrait is the easiest way of calling it, of a moment between two friends. And... Uh, um, I've basically been making some sort of deconstructed film about my friends and relations for about 15 years. And in these 15 years, I've created um, a constantly evolving archive of material footage that I edit in different films according to the moments of life. Um, it took me quite a long time to understand this method of working because it's, it's, it's quite uh, exhausting. I know we're not meant to talk about personal exhaustion, so I'm not going to go that way. Uh, but of course, uh, on, from a film, filmmaker perspective, when you speak to a producer and say that you're making a film for 15 years, they just run away. Uh, and that's what happens. And uh, um, so it's been and it's, it's, it's a very, very interesting moment right now because uh, I'm actually understanding the nature of this archive just now, after all these years of looking at it and like f keep filming and, and also the people that I've filmed because it's been so long in the years, they started to participate and they started to understand the archive together with me, what is it and how and what it can become. So basically what you're going to see tonight in these different moments are parts of this archive in, in, different, in different articulations. And in the same time, what happened is that I realized that I don't really care about films that much, uh, as uh, in the sense that I really enjoy making them, but I don't enjoy looking at them. Uh, so what I really enjoyed was the thrill of being together and creating those moments. So in the meantime, because I really didn't know why I belonged, no one understood where I belonged, not even me. Uh, I didn't want to show things in gallery. I didn't want to. I didn't know what was my contest. The film festivals didn't wasn't really my thing. So, so basically, um, uh, I started recently in the last five years. I mean, I've been doing events with a collective for ten years, and in these events, I, I realized my addiction for the thrill of creating the moments, and then the moments disappear. So I think a combination with a sort of deconstructed, constantly evolving archive of relationship, and the combination of ephemeral thrill of event making made me understand that the way forward for me was to build film sets and to open them to audience in the form of an event. In the same time, I was filming the film 
and then I could integrate elements of the archive and the film together and build this mad film which I'm making. And uh, the first, uh, one of the first, first important moments was probably in Czech Republic in this festival called PAF, Film, film and Art and Animation, which is a great festival. Uh, and um, and uh, I built a temporary set in this old convent and uh, created some mise en scene with these uh, musicians who are part of the archive. And I've read this text, uh, actually this text that I'm gonna read to you now, very brief. Um, basically, I've asked them to talk about their friendship, which is something that musicians don't particularly like to do because they like to play music, not to talk about friendship. <laughs> so in the moments that I realized that it was sort of like a, a bad performance, uh, where like the music musicians were really disoriented about and then started to go into small talk uh, because it was filmed. So it's, it's basically the entire convent, the area of the convent turned into a film set and the audience would come in. And I asked them to talk about how the friendship affected the way they were making music, how the city affected the way they were making music, how the context affected, how they felt it was all this like... And then sometimes, of course, they got disoriented. And so when they when they got disoriented, I was reading this this sentence that was given to me by Cabello Malazzi, the curator from the Kunsthalle in Bern, when I was trying, like now, struggling to explain to her why I was doing all this. And um, I curated a show there called Techniques of Care, which involved all the people of the archive. And she told me really kindly, Rebecca, I understand what you mean with friendship out of the domestic realm. You don't have to... You don't have to explain it to me. I was like, really? Okay. Uh, but then she said, read this, and I'll read it to you. Maybe it's nice, maybe not. I don't know. Okay, so it's, it's, uh, it's um, by this woman called Svetlana Boim, and it says, writing about men and women in dark times, Hannah Arendt observed that in circumstances of extremity, the illuminations do not come from philosophical concepts, but from the uncertain, flickering, and often weak light that men and women kindle and shed over the lifespan given to them. This luminous space where men and women come out of their origins and reflect each other's sparks is the space of humanness and friendship that sheds lights on, the world, on this world of appearances we inhabit. In other words, friendship is not about having everything illuminated or obscured, but about conspiring and playing with shadows. Its goal is not enlightenment, but luminosity, not a quest for the blinding truth, but only for occasion, occasional lucidity and honesty. Its goal is not enlightenment, but luminosity, not a quest for the blinding truth, but only for occasional lucidity and honesty. So for, this was a really beautiful sentence that helped me a lot and helped me also develop a relationship with lights and with Charlie Hope, who also will be doing the lights tonight, both for Kobe Say and Portraits of Friends. And so to have the, the people that I've been working with and talking with here with us tonight is the thing that is mostly the most important to me and the thing that I realized over the years of trying to understand why I was putting myself in this complicated, constantly evolving uh, situation, uh, it was that friendship was really the most radical thing because when two people are together, they're not buying, they're not consuming, they're not, the only reason one is a true friendship is, is to exchange this, these moments of occasional, occasional um, honesty. And, uh, and also the interesting things about humans is that we're constantly changing. So even friendship is never the same, you know, we're friends and one day we like each other and the next day we hate each other. And, and to make a, a film for 15 years, it means that, you know, the, the relation constantly changed. And, and, and the more that my film started to get screened and exist in the world and the more they reacted differently to me when I was pulling out the camera, and, and that was also an interesting moment to realize that, you know, spontaneity and intimacy, it becomes a tool as well uh, and a language. And um, another thing that happened is that now I'm touring with these sort of fragments of films and the musicians that are part of the film together. And in this way, 
um, the musicians get paid and they grow and I grow and understand more about the film and I'm just realizing that also the fact of not belonging to any context and to figuring out my ways of existing in the struggle and the exhaustion made me find find a format that worked for this that pushed through through the through the complexity and and that is sort of moving like like a like a being and growing with all the people involved and hopefully others that will you know tag along and i find that very enriching if i don't you know die in the process I, I don't know how much I've talked, but I think that's enough. Thank you. Okay. Äh, ja, danke. Äh, ich spreche jetzt mal äh, auf Deutsch. Ihr habt ja die, die Übersetzung auch dabei. Danke für die Gelegenheit, auch hier sprechen zu können. Äh, eine ganz andere Perspektive nämlich äh, eine politisch staatliche Hallo? eine politisch staatliche Perspektive auf das, äh, auf das Thema äh, Climate Exhaustion und ich möchte hier kurz äh Okay Ah, hört sich besser an. Gut, äh, genau. Ich möchte hier kurz äh, anfangs erwähnen, dass ich als Privatperson äh, spreche und nicht als Regierungsvertreter. Genau, äh, ich arbeite im Bundesministerium für Wirtschaft und Klimaschutz und äh, dort in der Abteilung Klimaschutz, insbesondere äh, in dem Thema Energietransformation und möchte hier kurz in den zehn Minuten darauf eingehen, einmal diese staatliche Perspektive, aber auch auf dieses Thema Klimaerschöpfung und wie politische Kommunikation, öffentliche Kommunikation dazu beiträgt und wie, wie wir uns vielleicht davon auch lösen können. Genau, ich äh, habe selbst früher für Verbände gearbeitet und dann sozusagen die, die Perspektive gewechselt, auch aus, aus dem Grund von, von einer Erschöpfung, dieses Gefühl vielleicht nicht immer was bewirken zu können und ähm, ja, Genau, das ist sozusagen dieser, dieser Hintergrund. Ja, die grundlegende Frage äh, ist so ein bisschen im staatlichen System bei uns, wie funktioniert der Prozess der Transformation und der Umsetzung? Wir müssen Klimaschutz, Klimawandel überall mitdenken, in, in jedem Bereich, in, 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 der, in der Bildung, in der Kultur, aber eben auch in der Wirtschaft. Und äh, wie geht das? Also wie, wie schaffen wir das? Und gerade bei uns ist das... Das zentrale Thema, das überall da, wo sozusagen unser Markt, unsere Wirtschaft versagt, es alleine nicht schafft, müssen wir einen Ordnungsrahmen schaffen, um Klimawandel oder also den Klimaschutz damit reinzudenken. Und dieser Ordnungsrahmen kann einmal beispielsweise in einem CO2-Preis äh, äh, sich zeigen oder eben indem man Ausbauziele für Flächen, für erneuerbare Energien schafft, beispielsweise Windflächen. Ähm, um diesen Ordnungsrahmen abzustecken. Genau. Äh, wichtig ist mir dieser Punkt, wo stehen wir als Gesellschaft in, in, diesem, in diesem Prozess? Und ich möchte das kurz anreißen, um die Klimaerschöpfung besser, äh, besser aufzeigen zu können. Äh, ich sehe hier zwei zentrale Stufen. Die erste Stufe ist ähm, die Frage, ob wir den Klimawandel ernst nehmen, also dieses How, also, also dieses ist es wirklich der Fall? Diese Stufe ist meines Erachtens durch. Vor vier bis fünf Jahren kam der Druck der Straße mit Fridays for Future und weiteren Bewegungen und die Regierungen haben hier nachgesteuert und dementsprechend äh, ist es super, dass diese Stufe geschafft ist. Die viel schwierigere Stufe, auf der wir uns jetzt bewegen, ist die zweite Stufe, nämlich wie. Also wie schaffen wir es, äh, hier einen Ordnungsrahmen zu schaffen, um in Zukunft gut miteinander zu leben zu können und das Problem richtig anzugehen. Diese Stufe ist äh, wesentlich schwerer aus meiner Sicht, weil sich wesentlich mehr Gegenwind äh, in dieser Stufe befindet, weil es viel mehr auf die Rechte und Freiheiten von einzelnen BürgerInnen äh, eingeht und äh, dementsprechend schwierig, schwierig zu greifen ist. 
Wie hängt das jetzt mit Klimaerschöpfung zusammen? Äh, Klimaerschöpfung, Climate Exhaustion, beschreibt so ein Gefühl der Machtlosigkeit. Also Helen hat das in einem unserer Calls ganz, ganz schön be beschrieben mit, ich, ich weiß gar nicht manchmal, was ich machen soll. Ich, für, ich, also ob ich jetzt irgendwie Plastik wegwerfe, ist es jetzt schlecht oder gut? Und äh, Caroline Hickman, die, die Psychologin, hat hier den, den interessanten Begriff der, der Klimaangst äh, geprägt, der dadurch entsteht, dass Klimawandel wie so ein, so ein Hyperobjekt über uns schwebt da oben. Das lässt sich damit ganz gut erklären, wenn ich mit meiner Faust auf eine Scheibe schlage, dann bricht die Scheibe. Also Ursache, Wirkung ist, ist direkt äh, greifbar. Bei dem Problem des Klimawandels ist es nicht so. Wir, wir pumpen äh, Tonnen von CO2 in die Atmosphäre und der Regen fällt nicht direkt, sondern auf verschiedenen Teilen der Erde zu verschiedenen Zeiten. Es gibt keine Ursache, Wirkung, ähm, die man direkt sieht, sondern nur durch wissenschaftliche Studien, nach, Studien nachweist. Aber es ist deswegen nicht so gut greifbar und dadurch kann auch so eine, so eine Erschöpfung, so eine Angst entstehen. Dieses, ich weiß nicht, was da noch kommen wird. Genau. Und äh, mir ist wichtig, jetzt darauf einzugehen, wie können wir dem entgegentreten. Und äh, meine zwei zentralen Punkte sind einmal, es geht um die Art und Weise der Kommunikation und Wahrnehmung. Also wie wir über dieses Thema sprechen, öffentlich und wie wir darüber nachdenken. Äh, Genau, und dazu ist es wichtig, einmal sich zu fragen, die, wie funktioniert die öffentliche Wahrnehmung? Ich möchte das an einem Beispiel kurz festmachen. Äh, wir haben das, das Problem, Thema Tempolimit ist allen wahrscheinlich hier jedenfalls in der Region bewusst. Ist ein super leidiges Thema, wir haben immer noch kein Tempolimit auf Autobahnen, äh, finde ich auch furchtbar. Trägt aber nicht wirklich groß zu dem, zu dem ganzen Problem bei, ob wir das jetzt lösen oder nicht. Auf der anderen Seite haben wir den European Green Deal, der äh, in verschiedensten Sektoren Emissionsmengen rapide senkt und einen Ordnungsrahmen hier schafft, der aber in der öffentlichen Wahrnehmung viel tiefer ist. Und wenn man das vergleicht, ist es wie so, die, dieses Tempolimit wie, hat so einen Impact und der, der Green Deal hat einen Impact vielleicht von der Größe dieses, dieses Domes. Und dieser Punkt ist mir, ist mir ganz wichtig, dass man sich nicht in so einem Kulturkampf verfängt über einzelne Punkte, die vielleicht dann auch dazu beitragen, dass wir uns erschöpft fühlen, auch in dieser Debatte erschöpft fühlen. Genau, und äh, der, der zweite Punkt hierzu ist es, dass wir die wichtigste Form, auch die es gibt, nämlich de, der Protest, dass der äh, auch ein, eine Art ja, dienlichen Protest darstellt, weil keine Transformationsbewegung kann alleine aus ähm, Enttäuschung und Wut äh, nachhaltig leben. Es, es kann der Grund sein dafür, dass sie sich, sage ich mal, formt. Aber Protestbewegungen sollten die Gesellschaft nicht äh, insgesamt spalten. Und wenn sie das tun, dann dienen sie letztendlich nur Partikularinteressen. Und der Punkt, der mir hier äh, von, von Herzen ist, sozusagen, ist, dass wir bei dem ganzen Thema, über das wir sprechen, alle mitnehmen müssen, die, die gesamte Gesellschaft und Bruno Latour würde das als äh, Common Matter of Concern beschreiben, dass wir das als, als, als Gathering zusammen, zusammen verstehen und nicht nur äh, in, so eine, in so eine Spaltung reingehen. Äh, genau, wichtig äh, vielleicht hier das auch nochmal so ein bisschen zu erklären, dass wir diese, diese gesellschaftliche Mehrheit brauchen, ist vor wenigen Tagen auf europäischer Ebene das äh, sogenannte äh, EU Restoration Law äh, im Umweltausschuss der europäischen, ähm, des Europäischen Parlaments gescheitert. Ein unglaublich wichtiges Gesetz, äh, das unsere Moore wieder vernässt und das Grün in die Städte bringt, hat eine enorme Reichweite auch im Punkt, Punkt Aufforstung. Und äh, das ist gescheitert, weil es neuerdings, neuerdings keine Mehrheit mehr für diese Themen gibt. Und da geht es nicht darum, irgendwie finde ich, welche, welche Partei man wählt oder so, sondern es geht äh, wirklich darum, dass dieser Common Matter of Concern uns alle betrifft und wir das als unsere Angelegenheit äh, machen sollten. Und ähm, ja, genau, damit äh, möchte ich vielleicht sogar äh, schließen, um äh, genau hier vielleicht den Rahmen nicht zu sehr zu sprengen und gerne in der Diskussion dann mehr. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, and thank you and apologies to the panelists who we forgot to get translators for. That is a sign of an exhausted tech and production team. 
So I won't take up too much time, but I just want to take a brief moment because I want to allow plenty of time for Stammtisch where everybody can get into discussion with everyone that's present here. And then we also have an exciting music program that will start very shortly. Um, but I guess picking up on um, actually one of the last slides that Chem showed and something that I feel like also came up in all of your presentations, um, just this quote of that real art is the friends that we make along the way. And so the idea that friendship, art-guided communities, proto-zoops as networks of exchange, kind of this idea of like creating alliances and that the idea of care. And I'm curious, I know the panel's called Exhausted, but I actually think a great sort of counterpoint to feeling exhausted is looking at sort of the abundance of people and caring relationships that we have in our life. And so I thought that would be maybe one quick opening question to get into conversation with everyone of how do you believe that you create caring alliances in your own work and how does that show up for you, if anybody would like to share? Take it away. <laughs> yeah. You want me to start? Yeah. It's, um I do, luckily, uh, but also on the level of ZOOPS, this is how it works. This is, it's, it's fundamentally, uh, um, it works on collaboration and it also um, works only from trust. So it's not, um, but yeah, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's exactly a very important word, trust. So it basically means in everything, and I can only speak about my experience, but in everything you, you do, that you need to build trust. And to build trust, you have to constantly revise the way you act with others and build that trust. And in case it goes missing, understand how to solve it. And I think all that, um, it's a very uh, interesting way of getting to know yourself and others, the adjusting, the creation of trust and the creation of like a real network of trust uh, that can move separately and together in the creation of moments that can be articulated in different ways. And I'm just going to throw that reflection maybe for, for future, I don't know. But I found incredible how um, the difference between institutions that act mechanically when you speak about work and uh, the institutions uh, that actually are open to, create, to, to really creating a space for, for the creation of this. Uh, which is this specific occasion because th there was an openness and an allowness for different elements for, of the archive to exist. But uh, instead of that mechanical, the, going back to the sort of cynicism conversation, going back of like, oh, you got an idea, send me your bio, send me your stills, send me six sentences, this is the budget, and let's you know make it happen to actually, like at least in the curatorial approach of the institution, to open up possibility for the artists and those, these, for, to, to actually bring back meaning to words that sometimes become just like words, like ecology and community. And it goes together with all the funding application thing and the way that we have to, that we are forced somehow to exist in the arts. And, and that's why maybe instinctively I never managed to do that. So I went totally a different route. And, and, and I'm just saying it because it's very good not to go that route. Just saying. Oh. Oh. No. Who wants it? You want to share? <laughs> OK, maybe we'll keep it pretty quick and short, because I would love to continue this discussion at Stammtisch, which is a very special project that is taking place by the fire truck, where everybody has an opportunity to ask the panelists on this stage questions one on one directly. If you weren't feeling, you know, nobody has to feel brave. It's removing some of the hierarchies of this formal Q and A, and oh yeah, we'd love to give everyone space and time to share there. So I think thank you very much to our panelists. I hope nobody's feeling too exhausted. Thank you.